So hello, good evening, and welcome to the latest John Schofield Trust Masterclass. We're very lucky that we have Dougal Shaw, Senior Innovation Journalist and Debut Author here with us. And Dougal, you're going to talk to us about how to create a successful mini brand under the umbrella of news. So if you don't know, I'm Druthi Shah, and I'm really looking forward to this chat and catching up with Dougal. We also have in the background, we have David Stenhouse, who is our esteemed JST uh, chair here on the webinar, and it's going to be recorded and it will be available at the YouTube channel at a later date. Uh, before we start, I hope you saw that in the waiting room, the John Scoville Trust Charities QR code. We are a very small charity and any donation helps considerably. If you find the masterclass especially useful, do consider donating. The QR code will be on show again at the end of our session. But back to why we're all here. Dougal, Dougal Shaw has created an amazing book. Here it is. You have it in the background too. Um, and it's based on a series that he's worked on for several years at the BBC. It's a business book that's actually rather accessible. And what we're going to do is find out the secrets that make CEO secrets a success. We'll also be taking the audience questions, so do put them in the chat and we'll pick them up. Dougal, before we dive in, I'm sure everyone here would love to see a snippet of some of the films that you did that have resulted in the book coming about. So... Can we show us Sarah Willingham, please? Yeah, and, and this, one, this right? is a recent one. So hopefully this is going to share. OK, hang on. Tell me if there's a problem, shout. I realised really early on in my career, thankfully, that imposter syndrome was actually my superpower. So in my mid-twenties, I was running acquisitions for Pizza Express and walked into a meeting room. I was two minutes late for the meeting and the person on the opposite side of the table, the lawyer, looked up and said, oh, thank goodness for that. Mine's uh, white with one sugar, please. So I thought, OK, this is a moment. Walked round to the coffee, made him his coffee, put the coffee in front of him and said, would anybody else like a coffee? And um, nobody said anything, nobody wanted one. I made myself a coffee and then sat back down again opposite him. And as he looked up, I watched the colour drain from his face as he realised this enormous assumption that he'd made. And it was such a beautiful moment in my career, really empowering, when I sat there and realised that actually this moment where I'd had imposter syndrome anyway, running a meeting like this, but I'd been completely misjudged by the people on the opposite side of the table was actually this incredible superpower because guess who walked out with the deal? So that, wow. that one went out a fortnight ago. Uh, if you're interested, this is sort of relevant, but when, when I was recording that, so sitting, you know, standing in front of her, I was just filming on my phone like this and I've done a, I've done a, um, a talk for this group before about filming on the mobile phone but all, pretty much all of the interviews I've done for this series have been filmed that way on the mobile phone um, and just the reason I like that one is that she was um, a really good talker and it was a personal human story which is something sometimes quite hard to do when you're doing business features really make it less about you know the numbers and the figures and the stats but really quite a human story at work but how did that one actually come about? How did you manage to get Sarah on board and, and make those decisions about the treatment and, and what you were going to do with it? Because that one's actually quite popular. I remember it watching it. It was going quite high up in terms of the most watched. Yeah, that, that one did well. Um, so because the series has been going for seven years now, it's built, it has built up a reputation. So in the, in the early years when we were starting it out, it was, you know, a bit probably harder to persuade people to come on. Um, but because we've been going seven years, like now it's gone, it's gone the other direction. And I'll probably get about 15 to 20 pictures a day from people coming at me from all sides, like on my email inbox, my, some people try a LinkedIn message or an Instagram message or, you know, a Twitter direct message. So we've kind of, we're spoiled for choice in terms of the people that are suggested to us. Um, in her case, that did, uh, a, a lot of those are from PR. So that one was like, a, there was a PR firm who suggested her. Um, and I actually probably I prefer the ones that come directly from 
the business people themselves, especially when it's a smaller business. But she's, you know, quite a big name now and she's been on Dragon's Den. So she's a bit of a celeb. Um, so I and it's quite hard to say, you know, how we choose people. But obviously she was someone who I thought the public know because of Dragon's Den. I've seen her speaking before and she's a very passionate, good speaker. And also, actually, in her case, you can see there she, the, the context is that she started building up these cocktail bar chains it, since lockdown. So kind of taking a gamble on the high street. And it was we thought it was like an interesting to uh, that was an interesting sort of business aspect to it as well. But obviously, when you kind of go on a hunch that she'll be good, I went to go and film that. But I had no idea what her secret would end up being or that that would be the story. And the whole the reason I enjoyed doing this series is that each encounter is a bit of an adventure. You don't know what you're going to uncover with the person. Um, and with her, I chatted. This is how I've been doing it for the past year and a half now. We had a chat for about 20 minutes and I actually re recorded that chat in good audio quality, but not video. So she can be a bit more relaxed. And it's in the course of that chat that we go over lots of ground, her career, things that have happened. And I'm trying to uncover what would be the best secret to share. So that's how that one came out. And then it just takes 10 minutes at the end to record it uh, in, in video form. Fantastic. Just a quick note, while we're talking about chat, if you have got questions, do put them into the chat so we, th we can pick them up and, and put them to Google as well. Um, and on that note, so everyone has now got a bit of a flavour of, of what, you know, a CEO secret video is like. But you have been working on CEO secrets for, for many, many years now. So how did the series itself come about? So actually, if I look back on it, it's kind of the idea was born of desperation, really, because <laughs> back in 2015, I was doing a job at the BBC, which I really enjoyed, which was technology video journalist. And I was covering technology stories. I was doing my own filming and editing. It was very creative. I really liked it. But um, as often happens in the BBC in the last you know, 10, 20 years, it's, it's the con constant culture of jobs being cut and thing, you know, the rug being pulled under your feet, even if you're quite happy in what you're doing. So that happened to me in that role, that tech VJ role went away. And it wasn't, I mean, it could have been worse for me because I still had a job. What, what was going to happen was I was on loan to that job and I'd be taken back to my previous one, which I felt I'd kind of escaped. Um, and the reason for that is it was back in the, the heart of the newsroom, kind of digital newsroom, and it was working on a shift pattern where it was a really punishing schedule of like a mixture of 6 a.m. starts some days, then another day you'd come in the afternoon, finish at midnight. Then you might have a week where you're going in at 7 p.m. and you're finishing work at 5 a.m. And, and at that time, I'd had uh, two sort of young children, like under four. And um, I just knew combining the shift work with that was just like it was, it was not really sustainable. It was terrible. So I was quite scared that if I went back to that, I'd basically be plotting to leave straight away or I just or I just have to, to go because I didn't want to carry on. But right at that same moment in 2015, after I'd had, you know, the, the little talk you have with the manager where they say you know I'm, I'm sure this is terrible news for you to do um they announced that a new job was being created which is the one i've got now video innovation journalist and that was quite strange for them to create a new position because as i said it, the culture was all about cutting positions but because this job was all about video and innovation and being digital it was seen as part of the, the future of the bbc and therefore they were able to get funding for it so basically, when I saw that job, I thought I've got, the stakes could not be higher. I've got to get that job because I, I don't want to go back to what I was doing before. And this role seems quite creative. And I was quite skeptical about joining the business team because I didn't see myself really as a business type person. I wouldn't if I was reading the Sunday papers, I wouldn't, you know, go straight to the business section. Um, but I thought I really want to get this job. And the thing I knew is that I'm quite good at coming up with ideas, like kind of fresh ideas for things. And you might think that's normal in news, but it isn't. You, just, you can have quite a good career just sort of making other people's ideas that get handed to you from meetings. Um, but I love coming up with fresh ideas. So before I went to that job interview, I spent a long time just brainstorming, writing out ideas. Um, and I had and I had two, really. One was called My Shop, and that was the one I, I actually preferred it over CEO Secrets, which was about profiles of quirky shops and their owners and the kind of passion project with their shops. And then the other one for CEO Secrets, I just thought, well, I've worked in this building and I've worked next to the business unit and I've seen every day all these big, well-known CEOs coming in and out of TV studios doing interviews. So it's quite an amazing kind of natural resource of people that they come to this building anyway. And at that time, pre-COVID, I was working in the office, you know, nine to five, Monday to Friday. So I thought you could just like, you know, grab these people and just do a very short thing for social media, which would be a bit more personal 
and a bit less, um, you know, latest results in the in the business cycle. So basically, had those two ideas, and I went into the job interview, and I had all the questions I was expecting about, you know, talking about interest rates, deficits, and and debt, and the, all these financial terms. And I think I just just about got through that bit. And then at the end, I thought, right, now's my chance to wow them with my ideas. And they, they didn't actually have a section where they said, tell us your ideas. But um, they had the usual kind of, have you got any questions you want to ask us at the end of the interview? So that's when I said, well, look, if, if I got this job, I really want it. And these are some ideas I've got. And I'd start, make, I'd start doing these on day one. So that was my chance to kind of pitch, basically. And there's, if there's one bit of advice, I would say that kind of I learned through that is that... Um, in job interviews, it's not just about conveying your experience and your, um, you know, your what you've done in the, in the past. It's a it's a chance to sort of showcase your enthusiasm. So that's I think that really helped me get the job. And then, sorry, just one other thing about that because anticipating this in this chat with with you, Druti, I was thinking, hang on, why? That's a bit weird looking back on it. Why did I have the confidence to sort of talk about making a series? Because you know, in a job interview, you might. In news, you might often talk about some story ideas, but a whole series. Why did I actually do that? I was quite cocky in a way. But um, and I did a sort of pinch and zoom in my life, and I tried to look back a bit to realize what kind of mental state I was in. And basically, I think the reason is that two years before that, I had had this nice opportunity where I was taken off off rota and put into something called the Video Innovation Lab. And the point of the lab was to develop new ideas. And we set up BBC Trending, which is a big series that goes on now. We did the very first videos that went on Instagram. Uh, we experimented with videos for Vine. And that was, I wasn't, you know, running that by any means. I was just part of the team. But I was exposed to really great people like Mukul Devashand, who's a very energetic um, person who will, like, you know, have ideas, make things happen, build teams. And, all, and one of the best people I've met at the BBC, he's, he's left now to New York the Times. New York Times and another guy called Matt Danziger, who's a, a video journalist who taught me loads. But basically... I hadn't thought of it this way at the time, but I was basically being mentored on how to be ambitious and to do a series rather than just individual stories. So I think that's why it was even in my head. That's the power of mentoring. Well, that's really helpful because we all know that actually the John Scoville Trust is very much about mentoring and mentoring schemes. So that's brilliant to hear, Deagle. But it, this is great. You, you know, you clearly got the job, but then actually how easy was it to get that series off the ground? So it wasn't just like, I'm going to do a series. Here's here's my pitch. Why did it actually go? Yeah, let's do it. We'll let you um, do it. Well, I think there's two things. Yeah, One, if I just to go back to to this again, the fact that I knew how to film and edit myself at that stage may may uh, makes a massive difference because I suppose if you go in with an idea like I did, um, and then it's time to actually make it, and you have to say, well, okay, I need access to a camera person. Uh, and then you'll need to give me some editing time. Then all of a sudden things start to get complicated. But I could literally say to them, look, I'm I'm ready to start doing this now. I can do it myself. I'm a self-sufficient one-man band. So I would urge anyone, it has got easier to film and to edit. If you if you learn those skills, you will create lots of opportunities for yourself. So that's the first thing. And then in terms of making it, then I have to say, yeah, my bosses were very good to me. And they gave me the time and space to basically pilot the idea. So do a few practice ones, but put it out there, get feedback and gave time for the different series um, to develop. Because I did both my shop and Steel Secrets to begin with, and I had a nice time doing both of them. So, um, yeah, there was there was no kind of like big obstacle that had to be overcome at the, at the beginning. They were actually quite supportive, which they were right to be, because that was the whole point of that role to, to try out new ideas for digital. But on that note, how did the series actually evolve? Like, did you go, you know, you're like, I want to do this series. Did you have an episode arc? Did you have like, for, you know, in five years time, it looked like this. Did you have a business plan? Like, how did it actually come about from, I think we should do CEO secrets to, to them, you know, to yeah. them being like, okay, fine, this is where we're going to go with it. No, I, I mean, I definitely didn't think it would still be going after five years. I thought it would maybe go for, um, I don't know, one year, one year and a half, and then it might it might come to an end. I didn't really I didn't really see um a life for it beyond that. You just have to sort of take a leap of faith and see how it will go. Um, but the other thing that happened, by the way, is that so after about 18 months, 
it was the series was quite well established. It was not just going on the website as a regular offering once a week. It would actually to be sorry to begin with, it didn't go out once a week. We did them in kind of seasons. We did like about eight, then we had a little break, went away, thought about it, did another batch. It's only now that it's become weekly, actually. But anyway, we would we did it for about a year, going up to a year and a half. And then I had to, um, you do these things at the BBC called attachments, which are like little kind of holidays when you're lent to um, another department and it's like you do a different job. So I actually went away and at that point I thought, hmm, I'm, I'm leaving CO Secrets. And I felt a bit weird about that because I was like, I was emotionally kind of uh, saying, right, that's that's the end of it. And I've got to let go of this the baby and give it to someone else because colleagues were going to keep it going. Um, but I have to admit, I did think at that point, we were mainly doing CEOs, like big, well-known companies who were coming into the building. And if it had just carried on like that, maybe the series wouldn't have kept on going. Because I think after a certain point, you'd get maybe tired of just hearing um, the thoughts of these, you know, big, powerful, well-known people. But what actually helped to improve the series, and I, I, for, from memory, this happened more in that period when I went away for a bit, is that we started to expand it into... Uh, smaller startup companies or companies that just had an interesting idea behind them, but they weren't, you know, they were nowhere near being household names. And that gave it a completely different perspective. And one of the things I'm sort of proud about the series now is that it's a very sort of rich compost of the really big, well-known CEOs of huge companies mixed in with um, smaller companies you haven't heard of, just really, you know, sometimes they've been going for like one or two years. And a lot of the, the small companies are kind of so proud because they'll say, this means such a lot to me. I'm in the same series, the same BBC series that I saw, you know, such as the head of Unilever in or one of these huge companies. So it, ma it makes it mean more to them. But also it stops it being a constant parade of these big, well-known CEOs, because that's, I guess that's the danger with an advice series that it would, you, you could get kind of saturated with that. Okay, so talking about that, the fact that you do have these big names as well as that rich compost of, of a mix of names, I was going to say you're one of your fir first case studies was it maybe even your first was James Dyson, yeah, so a yeah. very very well known uh, CEO um, and inventor. So we've got a video of the first one, so let's have let's have a look at that. Yep, hang on, let me just give me a sec to roll it up. See, we get, uh, Dougal is so self sufficient. We make him come in and bring his own videos as well. <laughs> Okay, hopefully now when I share, this is going to come up. My advice to anyone starting a business is to employ good engineers and scientists and to trust them, listen to their ideas and believe in them and back them. Don't be afraid of making mistakes. 50% of your decisions will be wrong, but the interesting thing is to learn from them and then get it right. If you're a young person and you, you're entrepreneurial, I do recommend that you go to university and get particularly an engineering degree or a science degree or a maths degree, because it'll help you. And even if your enterprise fails, you've got a qualification to fall back on. It makes me laugh seeing the graphics for that because um, it was very, that was the very, very first one. And so it was really rudimentary. And I remember uh, I just watched the David Bowie documentary called Five Years or something. And the, the, the title sequence for that had something very similar with these uh, texts that would go away and disappear of that noise. So I just tried to make the same thing for CO Secrets. So it, was, it wasn't even made by like a proper graphics design person. I just did it myself in the, uh, in the edit. But yeah, with him, basically, we literally, we were at work and we, I didn't know he was coming in. We saw him having just finished a, a BBC in television interview in one of the studios. He was sometimes, they, you know, hang out a bit afterwards before they go off somewhere else. And, and literally, I just went up to them and said, um, feel free to say no, basically, because you didn't you weren't warned about this. But we're doing this new series. It's called CO Secrets. It's about sharing advice. Um, would you be up for doing it? Or just I've got the, the, you know, the the phone here to film it and it would just take an extra five minutes of your time if you've got time. And he was, you know, he was up for doing it. He had he went away. I think I had a very brief think and then he, he did it on the spot. So literally in the background, you see the BBC offices and the booths. It's not a very exciting backdrop, but we had access to uh, this very big CEO. But what one thing just to say about that over time is in the beginning, because we were literally starting out and people hadn't heard of the series, we took what time we could with the CEOs and they'd already done a BBC interview. So 
this is like an added extra thing they were doing. And I don't know what he was talking about that day, but whatever was relevant to Dyson and UK industry, he would have done questions about that in his TV interview. And then he was doing this as an extra thing. But over time, because CEO Secrets has got bigger and people, more people know about us, you'll get people pitching CEOs and they'll say, you know, we just want this person to do CEO Secrets. So now we've almost got the reverse issue where we'll have to have a little think about it and say, well, yeah, he, that person would be great for CEO Secrets, but there might be some questions relevant to his company and the economy that we probably want to be asking this person about. Um, and so we need more time with him than, than I had there. We do like a, we might now do, as I said, with Willingham, a 20 minute interview first in radio and ask them some other questions before getting around to the actual CEO Secret. So CEO Secrets now is like, is nothing like it was back then. And, and maybe that's another lesson when you're starting a series, make it general enough what you're trying to do that it can that you give yourself kind of wiggle room to evolve it over time but still you have to have something which allows you to kind of make it a consistent offering um over time again and again and again and one way that helped focus it for us was to think well what's the question we ask to these people that mean we're going to have something similar every week and i think in in the early stage it was um what's the advice you wish you had when you started out so it's quite an open question. You're trying to get an interesting human response from them. And that worked quite well. Over, over time, I think maybe like three years later, we start, I started to realize that it's even better if you can get them to tell a story, that I love the kind of story format. So then I'll say to them, is there like a light bulb moment you had in your career where you, something happened that really taught you a kind of business lesson that you can, you can tell in the form of a short story? Um, and if you've seen the, you know, the Graham Norton program, if you watch that, they sometimes have the section where there's somebody sitting on a red chair and if their story gets boring, he pulls a lever and they fall backwards. I think that was a slight kind of inspiration for the, um, for the story set, for the story way of, of doing it. Cause it's just stories are just always very compelling. Well, you actually say in the book, um, I, I'll have to recall which, which one, but you specifically mentioned how you told them to, to come back. You like, no, hold on a minute. I can't remember which, which character it actually was. Bad Ventrakia. Yes. Yeah. You know, he went and then he did his, he, he did his event and then you heard him speak at his event and you're like hold on it come back again so yeah. there's no qualms about saying actually let me re let me revisit what you what you actually are going to have for your secret how, how do you navigate that what well, yeah there's no qualms from me I think there probably was from him but he, he he very graciously did it basically what happened was this guy Bhavan Tarakia who's an uh Indian billionaire CEO who started all these software companies like Flock and Zeta he was giving this talk at an event in London for entrepreneurs and that was my chance to catch him. And so I spoke with him for about 20 minutes before he was on stage in a back room. And he gave lots of really interesting business advice about how you think about customers and then work on your product backwards and um, how you bootstrap a company to finance them. And quite very good advice from a from an experienced person, but fairly kind of technical advice. And then when then he went on stage to give his talk for a couple of hours. And I was I stayed I stayed around to watch him because I thought he was an inter, you know an interesting person. And while he was while he was on stage, he made a throw a throwaway remark about how as an entrepreneur you have to have a healthy sense of delusion. And he got his from his father, who from a very young age would keep saying to his brother again and again, "You can do anything you put your mind to unless it's against the fundamental laws of physics." And he used to say it again and again and again until they were the two brothers were sick of it. But he said actually having that mantra kind of drummed into him did give him some kind of crazy self-belief along with all the other support that his father gave him over the years, but um, that he kind of put some of his success down to. So when I heard that, I thought, whoa, that, that interests me on a human level. Like my ears pricked up when I heard that. That's the thing. If it interests me as a human being, never mind a journalist, that's what we're going to do for the story. So I said to him that afterwards, he was so tired. He'd been speaking for like two hours, but I said, that thing you said about you know what your dad told you, I think that has to be the CEO secret. Can we, just give me five minutes. Can we please do that again? And he he agreed to do it. I think he, he was a little bit annoyed, but he knew that um because he thought he'd done his contribution already, but he was he's probably glad he did it, I hope. Fantastic. Um I was gonna just roughly say, over the years, how many CEO secrets have you actually gathered? Um and right now, how many of you got lined up in terms of planning for for future episodes so right now where are we roughly at numbers wise i think we've done somewhere between about 325 and 350 me personally i've probably done about 150 180 of them 
obviously it's not just me i've had um there's jeremy howell who's done a lot of them as well there's uh when when i was away for a, that period i mentioned doing on attachment i've had colleagues who've come in and they've they've kept the series going so there's there's been other people doing it but between us yeah it's a, between 300 and 350 so over you know over seven years it's quite a lot right now there's myself and another vj in the business unit who does some as well called sam everett and um i think personally we've got one going out tomorrow and after that i've got four or five which have been filmed but i haven't started to edit yet so that's quite a, that's quite a healthy situation sometimes you let the, the tank run dry for a bit and you might be down to just having you know one or, or none and you've got to do one to come out by next wednesday um, but again, it's changed a bit because we're, we're now doing radio versions of them as well, which is quite a new thing. But that means it takes even more time doing the edits because you've done your vid. I mean, just doing the video, you've got to do the video one, the version for their website, which has to have all the subtitles on it, which takes ages. Then you've got to think of what the headline is going to be. You've got to do all the post-production stuff. You've got to do a square version that's going to go on social media like LinkedIn. They also go on World Business Report on BBC Global TV and mm. BBC News Channel. So that's yet another version. So that's already about three or four different um, video versions from the edit. But now on top of that, we're also doing radio versions. So they're going to run on World Service as radio interviews. And that means doing another version of it. So I obviously enjoy doing it, but it's taking up more and more time as, as the series uh, hopefully ca carries on growing. And um, on that note, it's it's not a necessarily easy time for people in the industry right now, but how have you managed to persuade bosses at the BBC with all the cuts that have happened, et cetera, to keep investing in your series? Like what capital does it does it offer that they're like, this is something that we need to maintain? To be honest, I don't think they really invest in it very much because it's it's a real shoestring operation. Like it can't it can't be beaten on price. Because if if you think about it, it's a lot of the time it's just me making it. So basically the cost is my wage. There's no editing costs because I'm editing it. There's no filming camera crew costs because I'm filming it or the or the VJ films it. So it's very, very cheap to make. And um if there's one if there's one thing in the series that we're trying to improve, and I admit it's um an issue, is that it can be a bit London centric because we don't have the budget necessarily to go traveling as much as we'd like, even within the UK. And the good thing about being based in London is that the world comes to you. So there's international CEOs coming in a lot and people from different parts of the UK coming to London. So we can, you know, we still can reflect it quite well. But if we had more money, we could do more of that. Um, although as a, on, a, on that note, one thing we learned in lockdown was that you can actually do a lot more um, interviews like this, like on Zoom, do recorded Zoom calls and that we've put some of those videos out and actually they've done very, they performed very well. So even though I don't think it's quite, quite such a nice experience from my point of view doing them, the end result can still be just as successful and you still find a good secret that does well on the website. Um, but what does happen occasionally, actually, and I, I don't have that much to do with this, but the series gets funding from outside the UK, so not for the, within the UK, but the BBC studios who do all the commercial stuff for global TV and for for um, web website viewing outside the UK. Sometimes they'll say, okay, you've got, uh, we've got funding for a run of eight CEO secrets if you do them, if you try and make them about global CEOs in different countries. And so, and because I guess they, I think they sell advertising around it or something outside the UK. If that happens, any money that it makes goes towards, you know, keeping the, the license fee paid down. So it's actually very good for the BBC that that happens. But it also means we get paid, a bit, uh, we're given a bit of budget so that, say, we wanted to do, we've done interviews like in South Africa or India, then we have some money to pay local crews to do a CO Secrets video and then send us the rushes and we usually edit it back here. But so that occasionally happens, but but most of the time there is not a big budget behind CO Secrets. And I think if most other organizations saw what we what we produce for the BBC and how much it costs, they would think that's like quite an amazing deal. That's actually quite a nice segue because we're about to show you a Sizzler video. So oh, yeah. do keep your eyes peeled for faces that you might just recognise. And then after that, we've got a bonus clip that will show quite how multimedia Google's, not just Google's, the operation actually is. So we we bring up the Sizzler first. Yeah. So the Sizzler basic, by the way, Sizzler is something, again, I learned how to, the, even the word Sizzler was from when we did BBC Trending. 
I think it was Matt Danzigo, who's a, who's American, who would call uh, a promo tape or show reel a sizzler when it's for a program. So basically, I think that's when they like show a pilot for Friends to sort of you know sitcom bosses or something. You call it a sizzler. Um, but this is a sizzler that we made for CO Secrets after just over a year to kind of explain to people what it's about. Um, so let me just call it up now. Your gut tells you things. Be absolutely obsessed. Obsessed. Network. Don't be afraid of making mistakes. In the busy BBC News business unit, we decided to try an experiment. Every week we meet dozens of top CEOs. He's good now. Say hi, Duffy. Right. How's that? Is that enough? So we thought we'd take the chance to ask these people a personal question. Take lots of risks. Deliver magic. There'll always be doubters. You've got to believe in yourself. Don't be shy. Could an open-ended question reveal something about their mindset? Some of the advice might surprise you. Never make a life-changing decision on a bad day. Uh, but I didn't want to fail, so I didn't fail fast enough, so fail faster. Too often, business is about suits, weird talk, I'm amazing, and then it's a little flick, professional, professional, professional. And I learned that it was much better just to do the whole fake it till you make it. It's advice that might even inspire you at work. Play to your strengths. Get a personal cheerleader. You want somebody who's in your court that's cheering you on and reminding you of just how good you are. Run to the fire. The creativity and integrity are everything. Business is about one line. The music sounds a bit like The Apprentice or something. It's, I quite like the music on that. <laughs> oh, that's cool. There's just, so there's a lot going on there. And then have you got uh, vamp, uh, another little clip for us as well? Because we're going to show yeah. the multimedia element. So you've seen all the, how many different, um, just just a selection of how many different types of people Google gets on. Yeah, and this one also shows you that it goes out on, as I mentioned, it goes out on TV. So it goes out, even though it's a digital series, it was conceived to be, you know, like you're watching, um, like you're having a Skype call or a, or a Zoom call one-on-one -on -one with the CEO it was designed for social media platforms, but weirdly, television actually really like it because it kind of breaks up their running order and it looks a, it looks a bit different. So it offers something different. So here here's another quite recent one with a with a uh, storytelling element uh, going out on BBC Wor World. Now, how good are you are receiving feedback and compliments, I guess? Um, we've been speaking to one CEO who's got some advice on how to give them based on some feedback he got himself. Learning how to mop a floor on the driveway of a liquor store had a lasting impact on my leadership style as a CEO. I was a uni student working on the driveway of a drive through liquor store and my boss asked me to uh, mop the floor. So away I went and I was mopping away and then all of a sudden I'm tapped on the shoulder, I turn around, I look up, he's a tall guy, he says, steve -o, you're a good bloke but you don't know how to mop a floor, let me show you how. And so he grabbed the mop and away he went, showed me how to do it, handed me back the mop, he said, do you get it now? I said, yep, thank you. He said, away you go son. What that taught me was that there is a kind and a really constructive way to give someone feedback of any kind, including feedback that ultimately says you're not doing a very good job. So taking the time to do that is, is fundamentally important to really making sure that people are getting the right message in the right way and able to respond as a result of it. Good advice. Now so, uh, so the reason I put that one in, a few reasons. One, yeah, the show goes out on television. Also, again, it's in the story format, which I think works very well. I just liked it as advice because I know in work there's people who are terrible at giving feedback, and I thought that and feedback is quite a big thing for all of us. So that's something that um, that everyone can relate to in a general audience. And when we do these videos, basically, it's always going to get on the business index, 
but I want to make it more of a universal message that's going to appeal to everyone, not just people who like business stories. So I want to get it on the BBC News front page and the BBC home homepage. And that means thinking, what's the thing that's going to really make it resonate with as many people as possible? And, you know, a lot of people in their day to day job, in an office job or anywhere where you're kind of line managed, you're going to be getting feedback from a boss. So that's why it was quite a good theme to tap into. And in terms of why we uh, another sorry, another thing about him is that um, the the often the ones we decide to profile are people where it will be quite a strong video element. So if the if it's a company that does something where it'll be quite cool to visit them, like I don't know, like recycling old cars, and we can go to a car yard and see cars getting smashed up, something like that. But it can also be a company which is like like in their case, a cloud accountancy, you know, software company that's B2B, that's like on paper, that's pretty much the most boring thing you can imagine. And the shots that I had there were just of his office and software on a screen. So that's, you know, visually it's not compelling at all, but that doesn't matter if the business leader has a very good personal story, then the kind of context of the business is kind of irrelevant. So um, I think that's another thing you can learn from that one. Fantastic. Now, I know that um, because it's quite a sort of short and sharp webinar, this one. So I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions around the book. And I know there are audience questions. I want to make sure that they get in as well. Um, And one of the key things is, is that this idea, this two things, I think, in one, how did the book itself come about? So from having this series, this quite successful sort of standout series to then having a book. And how did the BBC react to the idea of the book? And, you know, Dougal being an author as well. Mm. Um, so basically, I I had wanted to write a book for a while, but I wanted to write a book about filming with a mobile phone, because that's something that I'm very passionate about. And I went to a couple of publishers, and I tried to get them interested. I had organized little meetings with them. And in both cases, they were sort of, mm, sort of interested, but they would, um, what, what they would do is a bit like journalism, they'll have commissioning meetings in the publishing houses once a month or so, and they take it in turns to discuss ideas. And I think my idea about a mobile filming book was pitched. But it was it always came back and they said potential, but you need to change it. And they basically said it's too niche. They didn't think it would appeal to enough people or or they discussed changes that they thought I should make that I I wasn't really comfortable with. Um, So I kind of that's but that started the conversation with publishers. And then in the course of one of those meetings, and it was uh, this was the Bloomsbury one with a guy called Matt uh, James. We would just start talking about other things that I did, and because we'd connected, he looked at some things I was posting on social media, and he we we talked about CO secrets, and he, I can't remember who I think it was probably him that had the idea. He said, "What about you know? Have you thought about making CO secrets as a book?" Um, so even actually, that wasn't my first choice as a thing to do as a book, but I thought um, that it was a good idea, so we kind of explored it further, and then he took that idea to the their publishing meeting. With all the you know the wise heads of the and the marketing departments and things like that, and they thought the idea had, was a good idea, so that they would probably green light it. But then I had to go and speak um, to the BBC about it. But de- but definitely what and this is like a lesson I've learned from entrepreneurs: you have to kind of make things happen yourself. You you have you have to provide the activation energy because no way in the world would the BBC, BBC ever say, "Oh, this is a good series. We should think about turning it into a book." Dougal, do you want to turn it into a book? Or we'll help you do that. Never. That's never going to happen. You've got to be the one who initiates it and makes and starts these things. Um, but was it an easy process? I mean, because you've got now the publisher involved, you've got a, a well-known brand, you've got BBC, you've got IP, et cetera, you've got Dougal, and this is, you know, you are a debut author. Yeah. How did you navigate, I guess, all the stakeholders, as they would call it? Uh, so the whole thing took about two to two and a half years. So first of all, it takes a very long time. It's the opposite of news. Once I knew that, there was a potential publisher interested in Bloomsbury um, and it seemed a bit more real. I started chatting to people I knew at the BBC who'd done books, including you, Druti, who's written a very good book. Um, and, and then started conversations with the, the BBC studios people, the commercial arm who do all the books and things. And um, with them, to be honest, they're a bit more used to doing things like, um, you know, Doctor Who books or Top Gear, like really big things like that. So for them, they had to, and they've got set ways of doing it for that. I don't I don't know how much they've done with Bloomsbury before, but they had to go through very long, protracted things about the contract, which I wasn't actually part of, but a good, and I didn't have, an, I don't have an agent and I don't have any experience. And I had to, to look at my contract and some good advice that I got was to join the Royal Society of Authors 
and you join them and they can give you free legal advice. So I was able to get them to look at my contract because I can't, you know, I might be an employee of the BBC, but in these negotiations, they're looking after the BBC side of the contract, not Dougal Shaw, the author. So it was a bit of a funny mixture. Um, some, a couple of other things. Some people did say to me, um, do you want, do you definitely want to do it as a BBC book? Could you like call it something else and try and you've got the contacts book, just try and re-interview all the people and do it completely in your own time. But I, I quite early on, I decided not to do that because one, from a practical point of view, I don't have the time to go off and do that. The advanced money that I'm going to get for doing this is something tiny, like 400 quid. So it's not enough time to take, you know, time off work. You can't have a month, two months off work to do, to do this book. I had to try and, you know, do it in what time I had. Um, but also, I just think it was, I'm proud of the series I've made for the BBC. And this was very much a book about the series. So it kind of made sense. It made sense to have the, for it to be the BBC CEO Secrets book. And also then just from a kind of um, practical point of view, if the book was just do Dougal Shaw, then not, that doesn't have much traction. And it's, if it's on a bookshelf in a shop, you know, people aren't necessarily going to pull it down. If it's got the BBC Association, that's going to help get more people's attention and bring more problems to it so for those reasons I decided to do it that way um and then the other but the other weird thing is and I don't know how this happened but after the bloom after I'd sort of agreed to do it at Bloomsbury I did get two emails from different publishers saying oh have you thought we like this CO secrets thing we saw would you have you ever thought of doing a book based on this and I, I don't know if somehow people in publishing circles talk about it and they'd heard or if it was just sort of coincidence but there did start to be interest from publishers the only thing that could explain it as well is that because it was lockdown, we were finding it harder to do the CO Secrets videos. So more often than in the past, I was I was doing some of them as written pieces rather than videos. So maybe people in publishing saw them in that written format and thought, oh, that could they could imagine it translating into a book more easily. So that's that's uh, possible. Fantastic. I'm actually going to take uh, quest audience questions first, so at yeah. least they get a say here, and then I have got extra in case we've got time so let's have a look and in fact actually Nishta you've got a question do you want to ask Dougal yourself uh, speak with the great man himself or do you want me to read it out hi Dougal can you hear me yes I can hi hi Dougal I've loved your series from from very I think 2015 I had just become a parent and I loved your series uh, my question is about uh the tech difficulties you experienced early on and most importantly can you also talk about your camera gear what do you use how light your kit is thank you yeah thank you I might as well show you again in case it came up I sort of prepared one so if I was interviewing someone for it quite often it's just like this so I don't even use a tripod anymore I'm filming on my um phone and um, I use an iPhone 12 at the moment, but sometimes as a backup, I use an iPhone 6, so which is probably from the time of 2015, actually. And even an iPhone 6 is good enough now to film this series. An iPhone 6 can film in 4K, which is more than enough, you know, to go on BBC Breakfast News, BBC One. Um, because the phone is so light and they're quite short interviews, I'll, I'll just hold it with my hands like this. And because I have this plastic rig to hold it, it's very stable and um, that's fine. For sound, you, obviously you can't use the, just the normal microphone on a phone because it would be too tinny. It's designed for phone calls, not for not for interviews like that. So either I'll have a, a microphone like this, which I would just hold out if I was in a quiet location, or in my uh, kit bag, I have a Thai mic, a little mic microphone on a cable that I would attach here. And um, that plugs into the phone with the help of an adapter, and I would record it that way. In terms of the phone itself, at, at the moment, I use an app called Filmic Pro, which is quite popular. It's about £12. Pounds. Um, but to be honest, some people are, are kind of reconsidering that at the moment because the app is switching to a subscription model. Um, but in the when I was using it, it was just £12 pounds as a one-off payment. But it gives you a bit more control than you'd get on the native camera app in terms of um, the recording settings and being able to monitor the sound and things like that. So... One thing I do think, though, is that it has it has actually made a material difference filming it on the phone, because one, if you're filming a, a big, sort of well-known CEO who's had lots and lots of media experience, they're kind of they're used to doing TV interviews with the big cameras, 
but maybe they relax a little bit more when they see it's oh it's a smaller phone and uh, it's a bit of a kind of step change to a big tv studio type thing and then other times when i'm doing interviews with people who've from start the world of startups they haven't some of them have never done an interview before a lot of them have never done a bbc interview before and they're quite nervous about it beforehand so that if i was to go to them with like a a TV crew of a camera person, a producer in a suit next to them, a sound person, a lighting person shining a light in their face. I don't think they would probably give maybe such good um, responses in the interview, but because it's just me, we're standing quite close to each other, like a normal, regular conversation. I've got a phone out and they're used to filming themselves with their mates and stuff. It does, to me, feel very relaxed. And I get the impression that they can be a bit more sort of forthcoming and natural, which is how we get the best stories for the series. Um, and I think you asked about uh, Nishita about um, like technical issues, but I don't know if you what, if you mean something specifically. But there weren't really any there weren't any technical problems as such ever um, that we had to overcome. But yeah, we, I did film it with the phone, and colleagues filmed it with uh, their normal broadcast cameras. So you know you can you can film it any way. And in terms of what you're filming, it's extremely simple. It's someone looking straight into camera, and then you just dress it up with a few extra shots that you you know take um or that they they provide some stills if you're not filming on location they might send a few pictures of their factory or just something to illustrate what their business does fantastic i've got a couple more questions so if we'll see if we can try and squeeze them in for a time so we've got gareth gareth do you want to uh ask Dougal yourself or I, or I can but i thought it'd be nicer if you did <laughs> of course uh Dougal, at the start of the the chat you kind of alluded to the fact that you got access to all these fantastic guests like uh, Sir James Dyson because you worked at the BBC. What yeah. advice would you have if you were starting CEO Secrets again from day one, but you weren't doing it for a part of a large news organisation? You were just kind of just start starting yourself as a as a freelancer or as a passion project. Yeah. What, what have you learned from doing CEO Secrets? That if you didn't have the backing of let's say the BBC behind you, you would how you'd approach starting CEO Secrets again? Um, first of all, I mean, I would make it diff. I, I would make it differently if I was doing it again because I don't want to repeat myself. So I'd do a different sort of version of it. I'd maybe I find a different, a different sort of question or something, something else to hang it on. I would probably, I'd say first of all as well, you'd be surprised that when you reach out to entrepreneurs, they're quite generous people because a lot of them have been through tough times to get to the top, and they've relied on networking. And a lot of the entrepreneurs I speak to say, you know, it's actually fine to reach out to some of the people you admire in business and get their advice. And even though they're busy, they will schedule time for you. So if you were, if you reached out to a lot of the big companies, um, you know, it's not like reaching out to a Hollywood star. You've got a bit of a, you do have a better chance than you think probably. And a lot of them, if they, if they relate to the idea of the series and they think it's going to help other entrepreneurs, what they're doing, then they might be more willing to do it than you think. Um, but I suppose if I was really in that position, I might try and recalibrate it a bit and say, make it, a, you could make it about, for example, the world of social, social media influencers. Um, there's a lot, of, there's a lot of them. It would help to kind of, uh, promote organic growth of your series because they would start shouting about the fact they'd been on it. Everyone, you know, it's a lot, it's the ambition of a lot of people for right or wrong to be a social media influencer amongst the younger demographic. So you could do something about that world and the people would be a, a lot easier to reach and more willing to do it. Or if you just want to look into the, the startup ecosystem, there are so many uh, startup conferences or groups of mentors or organizations that exist to help startups. There's lots and lots of different things you can plug into. And a lot of them are desperate for, you know, as you would be if you're a, start if you're a, a small company just starting out, you want any kind of exposure and publicity so if you reach out to the smaller ones, I think you can find a lot of people who would, who would do the interviews. Uh, and like I say, when we only do one a week, I'm getting pitched about 15 to 20 people a day. So there's like a, it's just uh, what we do is a tip of the iceberg in terms of what's being offered. There's loads and loads of businesses out there who would love the publicity. And it's all about your approach. You could, if you ask the right question, if you get under their skin, if you find the right angle to the story when you meet them, you can you know, a company that's not that well known, you could turn into a video that goes viral or does extremely well. So a lot of it is down to your approach to the story as much as the sort of status of the business. 
on that note, so Emma's actually um, coming, I guess, from a PR background. And uh, Emma, do you want to quickly Hi, ask yeah. your question? So, do you Hi you there, you? yes. Um, well, I've pitched to you many a time, but I've also ha happily successfully got a few clients in there um, yeah. with Jeremy, actually. Um, I was interested to know um, just a little bit more about why you would rather hear from the founder, because quite often I'm employed to kind of pitch to them and they don't have the time or the knowledge to, to find these opportunities. So. Um, any tips for how not to be an annoying PR, basically? When you say, hang on, you mean the, why the founder and not who instead? No, no, why you would prefer to hear direct from the founder as opposed to their PRs, basically. Because quite often oh, we're obviously employed bit. to, we're, we're employed to pitch to you because they don't have the time. So it's just, is it because you've had a bad experience with PRs or you just, is it just too much hassle or, you know? No, I mean, for the big companies, you're not going to you're never going to hear it direct from the boss. Of course not. That's why they farm it out to other people. So sometimes when it's come, it's only this very, very small company starting out that would write to you directly. Like I've had someone from Croydon who was like a, a teenager who started off selling crisps at school and stuff, started his own fashion label, um, who d ended up doing a very good video for us. But he had to um, he wrote himself because no way in the world could he afford a PR. So some it's sometimes it is nice to hear directly because it feels kind of quite un like unvarnished and you're hearing them in their own authentic voice from the beginning. But no, I don't discount PR ones. We do we a lot of the ones we've done have, be, have come through PRs. And so, so it's not that I don't look at those ones. One one problem that is hard to navigate is if you imagine it's such a, a small team that it's basically at the moment. So Jeremy's like left, he's gone on to do something else. It's basically just me as the main person doing it. Occasionally, I get help from one or two other people to take on an episode, but I'm, it's, I'm mainly doing it full time. So on top of filming it and editing it, all the post-production, uh, the things you wouldn't even think about, like, like writing the cues for the television presenters, sorting out um, music copyright situations, all, all the kind of stuff that goes with this. If on top of that, you've got, to be, we, have, we haven't got a dedicated guest booker. So if you've got, 20 people a day pitching people and a lot of them i read every single one because i don't want to miss a good opportunity but it's quite hard from that to figure out uh who the good ones are going to be so you're going on a gut feel quite quite a lot of the time we do have certain kind of ideas that guide us that i've tweeted about before but the problem is at first i would say although i read everything um i can't even promise a reply to everyone and then i realized that people sometimes just want clarity so even if you get back and say a, a short no they quite sometimes I think a lot of people quite like that because it's like at least he saw my pitch and he thought about it. But then when you go down that road, people start to say, "Why was it a no? I want some. I want some feedback." Um, and then literally haven't got time to go through every pitch and say, "Well, this was good. This was good. This was good," and and sort of hold the hand a bit and say, "But you could do this next time." Like just literally, there is not time to do that. Um, but, but then also like sometimes Google... if you give a few even a few encouraging words like well this person's a maybe but right not right now but a bit later on then a lot of people will prs will pounce on that and say oh that's great so can we maybe pencil something in for january um and basically i think a lot of people are working on short-term contracts and if they're going to get paid they need to sort of have something vaguely booked now um in order to get paid i think that sometimes that's maybe the motive but it's, it's very very hard from from uh, our point of view but if you want advice on how to pitch well, I would say just think of it from the audience's point of view. Think of it from what the headline might be if I'm going to try and get it on the front page and speak to the person first. Just have a quick conversation and say, this is the series. Look at some examples of previous versions of, of episodes. What would your kind of secret be? What would your story be? Put that in the email. Explain what the company is. If there's any pictures, because it's quite a, you know a, a company that does something quite visual, then that's very good. that might help the decision as well. All these things will increase the chances. But yeah, you also just think of the volume that we're getting. It's about it is about fifteen a day, and that that adds up. That's brilliant, um, Dougal. Very quickly, so Chris has a very quick question, um, and then we'll start to wrap up. But hopefully, this won't take too long. Chris, go ahead. Hi, thank you very much, Dougal. Um, you mentioned you use Filmit Pro uh, to uh, for for helping to film. What do you use to edit, and where did you learn how to edit? Uh, and do all those uh, nice uh, transitions and uh, graphics that you put together? Uh, I try to keep the editing quite simple actually, but I edit on my MacBook Pro, the same thing I'm speaking to you through now. 
And uh, some people do film on the phone and edit on the phone. And there are some quite good editing apps like Luma Touch uh, or even iMovies, you know, it's quite, quite good that you, you could do basic edits that way. Because um, I need to use BBC templates for things like the text that goes on screen and various other assets like that that have been kind of specially designed. So it's just much uh, easier to do it on the MacBook. And I prefer to do it that way because I don't like kind of pinch and zooming my edits on a little screen because, you know, you can be, you could spend quite a long time editing. So in terms of editing, I do it on the MacBook. Uh, where did I learn? So BBC is quite good over time at offering training. And uh, I started out as a researcher, then a producer. And then I just kind of realized that um, I didn't like telling camera people to film. I just wanted to learn to film myself. And I didn't like sitting next to an editor and saying, can you do this? Can you do that? And I've changed my mind. I thought I'd rather just learn to edit myself. And over time, the BBC, they have there's like an internal academy where they can send you on courses. And just over time, I gradually did some courses and I did some I downloaded some, uh, I think it's called Ripple training, but just some training on how to how to edit on Final Cut Pro and did that in my own time to improve. And then gradually, when you film and you edit, the two skills reinforce each other. When, you, when you're editing the stuff that you film, you realize that you've made mistakes filming and you, you stop doing those mistakes because you don't want to deal with the consequences and, and the other way around as well. So yeah, just over, over time, I kind of learned to do it. But definitely, it's got easier to film and, and easier to edit and if you can take the time to master those skills, you'll have a lot more creative opportunities, wh whatever you do, certainly yeah. in journalism. And you mentioned subtitles. I completely understand subtitles are so time consuming, but yeah. I just found uh, Adobe Premiere Pro has this thing where it automatically uh, puts the subtitles for you. And it's been a, it's been amazing. Uh, it's not 100% perfect, but it does yeah. about 90% of the job for you. And then you can just tweak tweak the text so that's that been sounds really good yeah yeah um because half your it can double literally double on, on a short video like like co secrets it can almost double your production time having to yeah. do the subtitles it's so time and also time. people will say to you oh oh yeah by the way that you put an ellipse in instead of a semicolon or something and then you've got to go <laughs> back and reprocess the whole thing yeah yeah very I, I, <laughs> yeah i i feel your pain diggle when it comes to subtitles thank Fantastic. you uh, thank you so much, Chris. Thank you so much to the rest of the audience. I'm just going to uh, sort of wrap up, but thank you. Dougal, um, David sent you a picture, which I'm going to ask if you can do me a quick favour and put that up while I'm just sort of wrapping up. But also do have a look at Dougal's book. It is available in all good bookstores. It's available everywhere. It's amazing. CEO Secrets. Um, and it's published by Bloomsbury. The series does continue on the BBC. It can be seen online and on the screen. Dougal is also a Mojo expert, and I'm pretty convinced we've got one of your videos on our YouTube channels as well. Um, so do check his work out. He is everywhere. Um, Dougal, you don't mind if people connect with you on LinkedIn or anything like that, do you? Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> but just a reminder, the John Schofield Trust is a very small charity. We are heavily reliant on donations to keep uh, the work that we do to keep, make newsrooms inclusive. We run masterclasses much like this one today, and we have a heavily oversubscribed mentoring scheme as well as much more. If you have even the cost of a coffee to spare, please do look at our QR code that hopefully Dougal can sort of flash up for us. Um, or you can donate via our website. Thank you so much, Dougal. I do very much appreciate that. Um, but as I said, Dougal's book is everywhere it's brilliant there's a lot of advice i've gone away and taken a lot do you go one last word if, if it's possible to sort of end with what's your sort of secret to to give to our audience what should they definitely sort of take away today um well it sounds like from the questions that there's quite a lot of people who are interested in the technical side of filming with, with the phone and definitely that's the thing that i've been that's kind of un unlocked a lot of possibilities for me, the fact that I learned how to film and edit myself. So I said that before, but that I would say, especially for something like John Scofield Trust, we're trying to empower people getting into journalism and getting out there and making your ideas happen. Just I would reinforce that point. You can, you can learn to film and edit yourself. It's not really beyond anyone, give it a try. And the fact that you can do it with your phone makes it um, a lot more potentially easy to do. I would compare it to if you if you're driving a car, it's like driving a car in automatic instead of manual. So it's just slightly slightly easier, and and you should do it. Absolutely brilliant! Thank you so much. Um, do get his book, do donate, and do keep coming back. Thank you, thank you all. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Much. Bye. Cheers.